But before all that, 20 years ago tonight, British forces had joined the US-led ground invasion of Iraq and were heading for Baghdad. It started a chain of events that saw Saddam Hussein deposed as Iraqi leader and executed, his country occupied, then effectively abandoned, and the entire region destabilised. Now, the justification for the invasion, the weapons of mass destruction, turned out to be false. Although many Iraqis initially welcomed the invaders, it would become a disaster. Still, nobody knows exactly how many people died. One estimate suggests around 300,000 Iraqis were killed by direct violence between 2003 and 2019. 179 British Armed Forces personnel were killed in Iraq. And nearly 4,500 American troops had died by 2010. As Garan Vincent reports, the invasion's terrible legacy is still being felt today. In the middle of the night, 20 years ago, the most powerful country in the world unleashed its might on the Iraqi capital. Explosions in Baghdad mark the start of the US-led coalition's operation to remove Saddam Hussein from power. At dawn, far to the south, hundreds of thousands of Allied troops invaded Iraq over the Kuwaiti border. Their immediate objective, the city of Basra, a city which was and still is home to Zainab Hamid and her family. Zainab explains that she was seven years old when the invasion began. Her mother and two of her brothers were killed in a coalition airstrike on her neighborhood. Zainab was among the injured. The invasion changed my life, she says, and changed my country for the worse. The threat that Saddam posed to the world, and in particular his possession of weapons of mass destruction, was the reason the coalition gave for its invasion. Weapons that were never found. One of the first British soldiers into Basra 20 years ago was Alan Jones of the Royal Marines. Legal justification for that war probably wasn't as foolproof as what should, it should have been. You can't not regret the catastrophes that followed because of it. Um, you know, mass collateral, mass loss of life uh, in, within the Iraqi population. Uh, and you do think about that a lot, yes. So regret, yes, it is, a now, it is now a regret for me. The catastrophes came thick and fast. After the coalition had declared its mission accomplished, Iraq was soon engulfed in sectarian violence and then full-blown civil war. Dr Ali Mathana was an Iraqi exile who returned to his country after Saddam had been removed. The United Kingdom and the United States invaded Iraq without an obvious plan to build the country or to restore the country. And suddenly we found all our military forces collapsed and we were seeking the first principal things that the human being is asking for, which is the security. The security vacuum in Iraq provided fertile ground for extremism. After the official withdrawal of American forces in 2011, the Islamic State declared large swathes of the country part of its so-called caliphate. Defeating the extremists took years and more bloodshed. People of Iraq are immeasurably better off, and I'll just give a few figures. Uh, the per capita GDP is five times today what it was in 2004. Life expectancy uh, for an Iraqi has moved from 67 to 73 years in those 20 years. And oil production, which is the only source of revenue, is four times higher than it was under Saddam Hussein. And yet Iraq remains a fragile society, and at best partially functioning democracy, which sectarianism constantly threatens to undermine. 20 years since the statue of Saddam was pulled down, Dr. Mathana walks to the spot where it used to stand with a question. What was the reason behind invading the Iraq? This is the question I'm raising for the United Kingdom and the United States. And I hope someone could answer me why. Why did you come and destroy this, this country? 
British troops went into Iraq, sure of their mission to get rid of the dictator. What would come after him? Well, no one was sure. The world has been counting the cost of the chaos ever since. Well, Garrett, you were reporting for ITV News. You're on the border of Iraq when, when the conflict broke out 20 years ago. And yet still it rumbles on. Yeah, 20 years ago, the US and its biggest ally, the UK, had a confidence, some would say arrogance, that they could use their power to intervene in a country where there was, in their view, bad government and replace it with good government, with a democracy, and everyone would live happily ever after. Well, Iraq uh, has meant that that confidence has now evaporated to the extent that when another dictator in the shape of Bashar al-Assad in, in Syria actually does use chemical weapons in front of the eyes of the world to kill large numbers of his own people, the US and the UK do nothing. You mentioned that I was in Iraq uh, 20 years ago. I was with a battalion of British paratroopers and I spent all of my time with them and I'm embarrassed to admit this now, Mary, but I was absolutely terrified that I was going to die uh, myself in a chemical weapons attack. I remember my hand shaking one night when we had a scare and I was putting on a gas mask. But that's what the soldiers I was with were most worried about. And you saw on the face of the soldier in my report, he's still processing the fact that what his commanders and what his leaders were telling him then about chemical, chemical weapons was not true. What was only ever a suspicion, a possibility, was presented as fact. And I think the damage that the chemical weapons claim did to the relationship between the establishment and the public here and in the United States is something that historians are going to be writing about many years from now. Mm. Garrett, thank you.